tied together, you got people scared. And then you got a picture in the corner there. If you guys in the back can see they're carrying on their cart. So basically famine Quite everywhere. <laughs> Very little bodies though, aren't they? One of them's a baby. Population sure. growth. Uh, yeah. like an revolution. Probably dead. Bad way. What are they gonna do with them? Depends on how hungry you are, right, Alex? Yes, if you're very, very hungry, they did it's that. It's surprising how my like, two little factories can lead to such a big... <laughs> Cannibalism in China, that's wonderful. They also... And they were very... Yeah, I know you were, but it was, that's true. They actually did eat some babies, and you know, if you, I mean, if you another mouse to feed, you know, you, you definitely don't want to keep it. Yeah, subtract so one. Why is that? Pregnant? Then you do to just eat one. Uh, yeah, so it'd be more. You know, I guess it'd be better off to eat the pregnant person. Humans <laughs> 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 God. So much more food. Yeah, I know. Oh, okay. To be quite frank, I don't think well, that tastes. Those babies are probably in pretty good shape. Right? Babies, they were vegan. By the way. China, well, ultimate stoners. By 1850, they had 420 million men. 100 yeah. percent yeah. Good job, China. Best part ever. They also have their... And then actually many other forms of desperation. They would do like they would sell their sons as slaves, they'd sell their daughters as prostitutes. If you got caught stealing somebody else's food, they'd hang you in the public square in a cage and everybody would watch you starve. And then they eat you. And then they eat you. <laughs> Just out of the cage. that were like this, you know, that are mesh and you're trapped inside and you just have to sit there. It's not from the neck or anything, you're just sitting there in a cage. All people can watch you. Okay, another another thing that's uh, going on at this time is they don't grow the government to keep up with the population, so that really fosters local corruption. Um, you know, if I don't have enough of my intermediaries to go out there and keep track of everybody, then the little local guys, you know, start. Uh, you get in these situations like he's in this little group here, out here. He's the local governor, and he starts taking bribes for everything. And you know, the rest of these guys are starving, and they're looking at Aiden and saying, "Hey, you look like you're gaining weight." And uh, you know they don't like their people that are in control, and they don't even like the people upstream either. So they hate the government because they're starving and they're corrupt, and so they have rebellions. And this is just an example of the biggest one: the Taiping Rebellion. It was famous because it lasted 15 years and 25 million killed a lot of people. Um, it took place in southern China, where they speak the Cantonese dialect, and that was where some of the worst uh, drought was as well, too, which was kind of the big agricultural area. And you know how we had, you know, like a lot of the early Chinese restaurants in this country, they're all Cantonese cuisine? There's a connection there because all these people in China that were trying to get away from the starvation and the war, as many as could, jumped on a boat and came to this country, settled in the west coast of America. They're opening up restaurants. We wouldn't eat the food, so they had to invent egg rolls. Um, we talked about this before. Uh, That's good. British still have this desire for Chinese goods. Now, this is 1820. They've had 50 years of industrial revolution, and that Wedgwood is making the China tea cups. So they don't have to get those anymore. But they still got to get the tea, because tea doesn't grow in England. And uh, silkworms don't thrive in England. So if they want silk, they have to get that. So there's still a lot of stuff England wants from China, and China still doesn't want anything from them. So you still have that trade imbalance where England is giving up a lot more in silver because they're not selling their products over there and they're buying all the Chinese stuff. And so this guy's thinking, God, God, can't, can't keep doing this. Keep, keep sending all our money we're getting from industry over to China. There must be something we can sell to Chinese people. This is what they get on. But 
field is that that guy is harvesting in Afghanistan there? Ricky? Opium, yeah. The opium poppies. All the red flowers have fallen off. Those are the seed pods. They split them open. They get that stuff out. And then they send it to India, where we have lots of free labor in the colonial India. And they process it into opium. And then they load it on a ship, a British merchant ship. And they go to China. You know, those desperate, starving Chinese merchants, they're going to get killed if they find out they're dealing in opium because it's highly illegal. But if you're desperate enough, you're going to make money by trading with the British. And so this idea totally worked. And the British government, it wasn't out in the open, but it was like, like total knowledge of the British government. They were drug running into China. Because opium, by the way, you can, what? Opium, you can, it's the basis of morphine and heroin. It's highly addictive. You smoke it straight in an opium pipe. It just kind of, you know, makes you feel nice and not want to do anything else. And you want more opium all the time, right? So it's quite a lucrative market, drug running. And so total reverse in the trade, and this is less than 10 years. They went from this $5 million trade surplus to a $5 million trade deficit. That's the opium pipe on the other end of the scale now. It's carrying all the weight. It's the exact opposite way around now. In the British on top. Now, the emperor. Yeah, wait. So, even though like opium was illegal, was like the British government directly selling it, or was it like? Not directly. Okay. It was like through British merchants. Yeah, they were aware of what was going on. They were favorable. They, you know, turned a blind eye because they knew it was enriching the country. <laughs> but the Chinese emperor was, of course, ticked because it's it's illegal and it's hurting his people, and so he declares war on the British. And of course, the British kicked the butt because the British were industrialized and they got steamships and they got big cannons and they come in and they blow the Chinese junks out of the water. And you know the, how I, I read that letter that time and the Chinese emperor was looking down his nose saying, well, we'll let you trade in one port just because we're nice guys. But well, the British said, no more of this one port thing. We're going to open up five more ports and you're going to give us this little island and it's going to become Hong Kong. And you're going to use that as our base for uh, continuing to trade. Go buy some opium while you're there. And actually, there's two wars because then the British start, uh, you know, expanding out from there, and the Chinese say, "Hey, you're violating the terms of our treaty. We declare war again." And then they kick their butts again, and then they, you know, take advantage even further, and um, it just gets worse. You're in Shanghai, right? Go to Shanghai sometime. It's got you, there's a whole section of town that's all European architecture. Because what happened here once it opened up is all the Europeans started coming in, and they didn't take over China the way they took over Africa. They still kept China intact, but they just moved into the cities. There's a famous sign they said was supposedly there once that in a park in Shanghai it said no dogs and no Chinese allowed. Europeans are just kind of moving in, taking over the place. All right, so, oh, and then of course, what it does to Chinese people is this opium habit is not very good either. So, don't do drugs. <laughs> good lesson. All right. Okay, now we come to this lady of the long nails, whose name, now, X in pinyin is pronounced with SH. So it's she is her name. And, um, she is the Empress Dowager. Dowager means like widow. So it means like uh, she was in, uh, married to the emperor. The emperor died. He didn't have a male heir. So she became the ruler of the country. And she hung on for 47 years. Much of this 19th century, while things were going badly, she was still in charge. And she kept stubbornly keeping with the traditional way. So after they got beat up and twice by the British, this group comes along. They're called the self-strengtheners. And they're, they're wising up. They're saying, look, we got kicked around by the British, who we used to look down our noses at. 
Why? Because they got these big, powerful guns in industry. We should go learn how to do that. But, so she doesn't want to have anything to do with it. She wants to continue to the traditional ways, and since she's got power, that's what happens. They don't try to learn the other ways of the West. Until the ultimate indignity occurs, and that is, they get invaded, not by a European country, but by Japan. And I could, why this is such an indignity, I think I had this picture up once before when we were doing something, I can't remember. Well, I guess when we were talking about why China was so great. This is called kowtowing. You know, they used to go out, like Jung Hu would sail his big ships to neighboring nations, and they would take like the ruler of the neighboring nation or the kind of secretary of state type person or whatever, and they'd bring him back to China, and he would pay tribute at the Chinese court, and they'd have to like bow their heads on the ground. This would be like the Japanese guy with his head on the ground. And this would be the Chinese. So this is what the Chinese are used to. And now these Japanese are coming in, and they're invading because, notice the picture, they're firing modern weapons. So they're starting to overrun China. How did the Japanese get the modern weapons? You know. America gave them to Sort of. Yeah, let's go back in time just a second. I have to jump over and show you Japan to catch back up. Now I'm going to go way back in time for just briefly one slide. This is before the agricultural revolution. Okay, So this is back when England is doing its water wheels and so on. you got England at one end of Eurasia. It's this kind of medium weak country, but they got good stuff going on in the background. Japan's very much like that. They're not a strong country either over at the other end of Asia. But they got good stuff going on. So it's kind of like England. They make the same improvements in agriculture that the English did. So unlike China, they're able to keep up with their growing population and feed them. They've been using paper money for a long time. China has too. That's where the Japanese got it. So they've got a market economy with debt and that sort of thing in place. Um, so all these same sort of infrastructure for industry that England had. They also have a well-educated sort of middle class of people already, which is, yeah. probably make you wonder, why would you get that we kept doing talking about the middle class comes from industry? Well, how'd they get this middle class before they had industry? Well, uh, these were the middle class guys. I mean, we know from Hollywood movies is these you know, sword-wielding guys and they're throwing those little ninja discs around and maybe they're stabbing themselves in the stomach and committing harikari when they do things wrong because they have the big coat of honor and all that stuff, right? That's the samurai of legend. But really, they were the warrior class, but they didn't spend that much time fighting. And they spent most of their time getting smart, you know, being more of this kind of middle class that's below the people that own the land, but it's above the ordinary people. So what you end up with is where England had the dissenters who couldn't own land, but they could go into industry, so they were ready to become entrepreneurs. Japan has the samurai that are ready to become entrepreneurs, if only they get exposed to some industrialization. And this is how they get exposed. In 1853, see, they've been just like China. They don't trade with the West because they don't want to. But in 1853, the Americans just sail in a big fleet of ships, just like Zheng He used to do with the Chinese. We sail in our Navy with big guns, and we say, we want to trade with you. And Japan goes, we will be your friend. Yes, we will be your friend. We will trade. Because obviously, you've become much more powerful than we are. And what they do, though, that's totally different than the Chinese, is they say, we've got to learn what these guys have. And so, as I said to Peter, indirectly, that's what they do. They start sending people to Hawaii, which is the closest outpost of the United States, and studying the industry there. They send people back to Europe and study the industry there. They proactively try to learn what the West has, and they teach themselves. And they bring it all back, and you got this ready-made class of entrepreneurs, the samurai, and they drop their swords for bow ties, and 
you know, they start making their first sake and soy sauce, but soon they're doing textiles like the ladies there, and then they pretty soon have factories with smokestacks just like in Europe. So Japan joins the party of the industrialists. They become one of the industrialized countries of the world, the only one in Asia. And that's luck. They run into the same problem the other imperialists do, which is the problem with capitalism. Overproduction. Overproduction? And what's it make you do? Same thing. <laughs> Go colonize somebody? And who do they turn to first? China, because they're right next door. They're an easy target. So Japan invades China, they take part of China, right along with the Europeans. And again, they're just like the Europeans, they don't really take over China. Well, it depends on your meaning of takeover. They don't politically take over China. They don't dissolve China and make them into a bunch of different countries. They keep China, China but they totally overrun the place. They take over all the trade, the Japanese, the British, the Americans, and everybody. So and this is my little summary then, if you get, um, since I have a mostly visual thing there. I mean, this is the kind of shows, the two as they went on. China had famine, corruption led to rebellion, Japan had agricultural improvements and an educated middle class. The British open up China through war, but they still refuse to modernize. The Americans open up Japan, they respond peacefully, and they embrace the new wave, and they industrialize, which allows them to take control of China, along with others. Make sense? Any questions? So, yeah, they say that'll play out more in the three. Um, did I mention you guys you were going to have this CBA coming up to end of next month? Yeah. You know, if you've been through those one every year, right? Question based assessment, you know, the seventh grade one, the eighth grade one. Um, do they get easier every year? Yeah. Do they get shorter? Yeah. No? <laughs> There's the same. I thought this one was supposed to be shorter. I don't know. Well, basically, what you're going to be doing is writing a DBQ uh, document based question essay which is a lot like that outline mini queue that we did on Reign of Terror. That was how you had documents, and you categorize them into buckets, and you answer a prompt, and you answer back and forth. So that's why skills practice, that's why I had this do the point of view thing, because that's part of it. And today I was going to introduce something here about writing a DBQ thesis statement, a little bit more we talked about before. But I'll continue to do that more after we get back to those couple weeks, and then you'll be doing it. So I had one last picture up here, by the way. This is my last slide I had was, um, it just shows we've got, what is this? This is Queen Elizabeth of England. This is the Kaiser of Germany. This is the Tsar of Russia. This is the Japanese guy, and this represents France. And they're all carving up China. It's in French, isn't it? It's in Chine. French, yeah. <laughs> yeah let's, see. Um, let's see, you guys should have had a pile of stuff in the middle of your table. Why? Uh, that was just a symbol of power, I guess, for the Empress back then. <laughs> It's just like, don't mess with me, you know? Oh, scratch you. Uh, so, let's see. Raise your hand if you're not going to be here tomorrow. Uh, just raise your hand if you're not going to be here tomorrow. Yeah.
focusing on okay. your pinkies. No worries. Before you guys leave, let me give you I have one thing to give you. Also, I'm trying to write in here. <laughs> Friday, yes. We're, is that what you're talking about? Friday? Yeah, we're doing reading Friday. Yeah, it's neater than mine. I still like yours, though. It's a <laughs> nice problem. Okay, let's see. If you guys can pick out on your table on your probably massive no, but it's just period, it's probably a messy pile. But the one that says exercise one on the front, which is on the back of the one that says exercise two. Good thing the person before me didn't. Uh, no, that's the document. Yeah, the documents yet. You want the, there's like the documents and then there's this other thing. It has exercise one and exercise two in the same back. Yeah, so it's like, yeah, it's got the box. Okay, let me, let me walk you through this because you don't have to read this whole deal. But if you look in the box first, in the box on that page, this is a typical DBQ, like you'll get an AP test, world history test. The DBQ is one of the three essays. And it'll always start like this. The instructions will always be the same. It'll always say something like, this question is based on so many documents. And as you analyze them, take into account the source and the point of view. And using the documents and your background knowledge, write your essay. Okay? It always says that. Historical context, you guys know that, so I'm not going to read that. That's what we've learned already. So here's the question. This is the prompt. During the Industrial Revolution of the 1800s, the non-Western world lost all will to resist the West's power, but also lost any real ability to adapt to industrialism in its own ways and on its own terms. Assess the validity of this statement. This is a typical type of question prompt they'll give you on DBQs, where they say, assess the validity of this statement. I actually do that in the other two essays too. So um, that's the prompt. Now, if you just look at that without even looking at anything else from what we just saw, what do you think about the validity of that statement? Is that a valid statement from which you yeah. bring in your background knowledge? You say yes? Who'd say yes? Who'd say no? Why was going like this? And Peter's going like this. And Ty's going like this. Okay, why? Ty, why? Remember, not China. It was, well, Politically, they didn't give in, but they got overrun. China. But who's the winner who does that? Japan. Yeah, Japan really, they don't lose all will to resist the West's power. They go out there and they do it themselves, right? So there would be an exa example there. So we know there's something wrong with this statement. Now, if you look at these five down below, it has one, two, three, four, five. Those are five thesis statements. What I want you guys to do is read through those and just Think in your mind, don't write down it because it's a class step, but think um, which two statements are good and which three are bad. And if they're bad, why are they bad? And then we'll just check it out and we'll share in a second. I'll ask you to give me a bad statement.
Let me volunteer a statement we should reject from this list. Then we go to Maya. First one, why is that no good? Okay, so it doesn't really address the, whether that statement is valid. It's talking about almost about all things that happen inside the industrialized country, right, that are bad. And it makes one little mention of problems made even worse by colonial control. But again, that's, that's your problems at home, right? And that's not what this is asking on this thing. Okay, so that's how you say it. Alex, you going to jump in Three is not good because what's wrong with that one? Yeah, actually, now where three comes from, and I wasn't having you guys do this yet, is that this is the documents, and in there there's a there's one that has this Cecil Rhodes guy, and it's, that's what it's referring to. But it's all referring to one document, and yeah, it's. Um, Maybe implying that it thinks it's a valid statement, but it's certainly not coming out insane. Right? Yeah. Okay. What's the other one that's no good in there? Right? Uh, five says it doesn't really uh, answer the question to talk about other countries. It just talks about uh, what could be other nations, not really how they ever It doesn't really say how they react, right? It, it says what they did to them. That kind of, but it doesn't really say how those other countries reacted or anything, so it doesn't answer the question either. Okay. So those, those two that are left are actually acceptable theses. Um, is there, of those two that are left, two and four, is one more preferable, do you think, to the other one? And we're down to two that actually work. Do you think between statement two and statement four, is there one that's better for anything? Okay. Well, the second, or number two, more than four, because four is just says it's kind of mainly correct, whereas two just says it's too broad. So it's more, uh, more of a strong statement. Although they both, neither one of those things says that it's entirely correct or entirely wrong. Right? They're both kind of in the middle. Which is totally okay. You don't have to go on one side or the other. This is not like one of those. Sometimes we give you these exercises in writing in English where we say, you know, you must take one side or the other. If they say assess the validity of the statement, it is, per it is totally okay to say that it's mostly but not entirely right. And they kind of both say that because the one says it's too broad, so part of it might be right, and the other one says it's mainly correct. But you're right. The one comes out and says it a little more clearly argumentative. Uh, is there any other reason you might favor two? What about, look at the, I always say you should try to come up with a three-part plan. So you make the claim, in this case you answer whether it's valid or not. And then it says something about three ways of arguing or three categorizations. And did they both do that? Like, look at number two. What, what's, if you were to write a three-body paragraph essay off number two, what's the first part of that play? Look again more closely at number two. The statement is too broad. Here? You, you could. Um, and that would give you two different ones. And there would be after three different things. But actually the thesis goes on beyond that. After it says not only not non-Western societies did not all respond alike, they actually, I think they do actually break it into three different things after that. So they take that statement and break it into three parts. What are the three parts? What's one of them? Oh, you see one on there? You could still see the first statement. That's what I called you on the first one. The first one is the easiest. The third one. 
So the statement's too broad, non-Western societies do not all respond alike. What up? We can break that down a little bit because we're going to break it into an essay. The first one is some are too weak. Some are too weak, okay? That could be the first paragraph of your essay. You're going to spend all this paragraph talking about these elements of these societies that were too weak to resist the imperialists or something, okay? What about your second and third paragraph? Uh, Which Alex? If you can't yawn or go <laughs> So now if you broke it down more, it's got some are too weak. Same traditional ways. Does it have two other parts or we only have one one other part in there? Matt? Um well also you write one about how some countries like China try to say their traditional ways or you could There you go. Very good. That's what I, that I would say is where it's broken it down. It's, it, it, it goes on to say that some adapted on their own terms, and then it splits that into some tried to save their traditional way, and some sought to modernize on their own. So, yeah, you could do two different paragraphs on those two things. So it looks like it's got it all there. It's got the three part plan, it's arguable, and so on. What about number four? So you already picked at that one a little bit, said it was a little bit more wishy-washy in the way it's stated, it's claim. The, can you break that one down into three parts? The very few non-Western lands such as Japan did adapt to the West threat by modernizing quickly, but the vast majority in Asia and Africa were passive pawns at the mercy of the Western colonial control and economic power. Is there actually more like two, I think? Because it talks about the ones that did adapt and the vast majority that didn't. Alex? You could maybe break that whole colonial control and economic power into two and focus on how colonial control had an effect and then economic power had another. Okay, so you could do that. You could do that. It's maybe not as, as clearly broken out as the second one, but you could break it out that way. Yep. So it can be done. Um, the next thing to do with this, that these of you guys that are going to be here tomorrow, I'm going to give you something to do, is that the thing is, when you're doing a DBQ, you got to work with the documents too. So we haven't even looked at the documents yet, and right now it sounds like we're kind of favoring the second one more, but maybe the fourth one works too. There's one more test you have to put it to, and you have to see which is going to work best with a set of documents, because I have to write about those documents. So that's where we're going to go to. You three guys, I think it was three of you, I'll give you the sheets, and then these documents will be posted on the website tonight. It's not going to be due till Friday. I mean, you guys. I mean, that is the next time I see you. Are we keeping this class since? Yeah. Yeah. No. Okay. I think we're just leaving here. Okay. Well, in case this guy got a good uh, shrimp start on that. So you won't even know. Yeah. Well, so good. Do you want to do anything on Friday since it's really close to the textbook? Nah.